Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Finding Me and the ITV Networks. Today with me is the author Asma Khan. Asma has written a book called Surviving. And I think for Muslim women or for women in general, the question about survival is a serious question. We face many complexities, we face many challenges. And of course, it is the woman who bears the brunt of conflict usually. So with that, I think I would like to begin my conversation with Asma. And I would like to say assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And thank you for being here, Asma, in your busy schedule with your busy kids as well. Jazakallah, Sister Kresha, for having me on the show today. Asma, you know, Muslim women are always balancing roles. We find, and, and I suppose it's not peculiar to Muslim women, that there are women all over the world in every situation. You're balancing. You're a mother, you're a wife. You might be a child, you might be a business person, you might be a homemaker. But there are very many challenges that we face. Do you find there's a tension in that responsibility, especially when you try to go out of the home or the homemaking environment and include your own personality? Definitely, there is a strain um, in today's times uh, with regards to uh, women finding their own identities besides the role of ma housewife and uh, mother. Um, and I think that, um, you know, in today's times, we're fighting to strain and get our identities and find out who we are. Uh, besides that, we've got the financial strain, the strain of making sure our kids are well taken care of, making sure that our house is running smoothly. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a juggle. We are constantly juggling all these different aspects in our life. It's often that people don't understand that women are going through these tensions. No, they don't. Uh, you know, a uh, lot of um, men uh, think, or lo even working mothers to housewives, they think that you housewives are sitting the whole day getting pampered and being pretty, but it's not easy. I mean, you've got a billion things to do and there's not enough time in the day to do it. You know, while you were talking about this concept of the housewife, and of course we discussed before we went onto the show about Nanima and you launching the book through Nanima, um, and this whole concept, this vision of this woman in, in her house, etc. I was thinking about a particular conversation, I can't remember where, I read it a while ago, where a man said that he wanted to employ a domestic worker. And so uh, when he was being questioned and they asked him that, you know, what would you like to pay? So he said, like, so much for, for the particular domestic worker. And so the, the questioner then asked, okay, then what would you pay for the cook? And then he looked surprised, said, well, if you have somebody cleaning, you need somebody to cook for you, etc., etc." And then, so the conversation went further. So then this person told the, the, the man or the husband that, you know, have you ever considered your wife? She's your domestic worker, she's your cook, she's your cleaner, um, she's your professional secretary, etc. Now add up all those costs and, and calculate the worth of that woman that you okay, have for you. And so often, you know, that's why I like the Arabic saying, you know, a housewife in Arabic is rabbul bait, <laughs> the lord of the house. And really, I think in many ways, women are like that. So let me ask you this. How does one as a Muslim woman consciously manage to accommodate your personal development in the face of challenging social and familial demands. Because on the one hand, you're trying to develop yourself personally, establish your identity, but then you're being pulled. There's a tug here from the family and there's a tug from the society. So, so how do you do that? No, it's, um, I think the most important thing to remember is that we need balance in our lives with everything that we do. And um, we need to know that this is the time for the kids. This is the time uh, to do certain things. And when, um, actually, when I was thinking of this question, the thing that popped into my mind was that in today's times, it's so easy to give the misconception of a perfect family or a perfect woman, mm. because we've got so many social media platforms where you can take a quick selfie with your perfect family, yes. post it on Facebook and go back to your crazy world. So it, it is, but you need to know how to balance everything or you need to know where to draw the line or create borders between each um, 
different area in your life. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you said that. Well, firstly, about balancing, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, that we have made you a moderate ummah, which means that you find your balances in all of your, uh, yeah, in all the different spheres. And about drawing borders, do you find it's important to learn to say no? Because I've learned that a very important part of being able to draw your borders or to be able to balance yourself is the ability to say no. Definitely, I need to learn to say no. I, I don't think that word is in my dictionary. <laughs> um, I think for a woman, it's a bit harder to say no because we are that uh, nat- by nature, we are soft people. But it is important to learn to stand down. You know, you, you're not saying this time where you have to stand up for yourself as mm-hmm. well. And we need to learn to do that more often. So super mom. Basically, that's what you're, you're being super <laughs> balancing, multitasking, I suppose. Multitasking. Yeah, but no, there comes a point in your life, trust me, when you're going to learn to have to say You have no. to. Yeah. Okay, so writing is an occasion of solitude and reflection. I mean, I find that, I understand that, even when I'm writing, you know, my assignments or doing my thesis, etc. You can only do that when you're in that moment of absolute solitude or your, abil- your ability to reflect because you need a peace of mind. You need a particular kind of chi, I suppose, around you. <laughs> You, so that those thoughts can filter in because thoughts are powerful but you have a busy schedule and you have busy kids <laughs> so so tell me how did you manage to sit down and actually write this book you know if I tell you that it was all very easy and went smoothly I would definitely be lying uh, when I started writing surviving um, I only had one kid at the time so it was a bit more easier he would you know he wasn't that active in jumping all over but um, I was able to write a lot, um, and then I, when I fell pregnant, I found it very difficult to write anything. When mm. I'm pregnant, I can't string any thoughts together. So it made that very difficult, and the book sat there for about two years without me looking at it. I didn't touch it. I even forgot about it until I decided to type it out because I wrote the entire manuscript out. So the old-fashioned way. So the old-fashioned way in a notebook, a 72-page hard notebook. <laughs> okay. And um, I, uh, when I typed it out, I just continued. But now I have three kids. So uh, surviving is complete, but I, I need to move on to other um, challenges. Mm-hmm. And I can't because I can't find the time anymore. The only things that I can do is early in the morning and late at night, mm-hmm. and I'm tired. Yeah, but it's all about, like, exactly as your title is, it's about surviving. We survive every challenge, and your challenge right now, and your priorities, and the balancing should be on the kids, I True. think. So So you give them that opportunity, you raise them. As Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that oh. the best thing that you can do for your children is to raise them as good humans. True. So the focus should be there first. We have to go to a break. When we come back, I'm going to ask Asma to talk a little bit more about her book. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to the second segment of Finding Me in the ITV Networks today with Asma Khan, the author of Surviving. And before we went on to the break, Asma was speaking about the essential ability of any individual to learn to balance, balance your priorities, balance your roles. And of course, you know, as women, we're, we're encountering challenges all the time and we have to learn to put our lives into perspective in order to give the best of ourselves. And uh, Asma, I think you would agree that the part of the ethic of a Muslim woman or a Muslim per se is to always do the best that you can in whatever you do. Very true. Um, you know, I, I think for women, we always second guess ourselves and wonder mm. if we can do it and how will we do it. And you know, we don't realize that within us, if we want to do it, we can do it and we can achieve anything. You just have to work hard and push yourself, motivate yourself in order to achieve anything that you want. And that's true because you never know until you try, isn't it? Otherwise, you'll always be a failure because you never made the effort to, to try. Now. As women become more and more educated, and and we're finding that, I mean, I'm encountering a vast pool of educated women. And of course, there's changes in the international and in the normal context of society. The world is globalizing. We're finding more incidences of abuse being reported by Muslim women. And strangely enough, it's coming from well-to-do families. So it's not only from the lower socioeconomic strata or the middle class, but it's coming from the upper class woman as well. So 
what do you think or why? Why is there an, an increase of abuse in Muslim households? I don't think it's so much an increase in abuse, but it's an increase in that um, these women are coming out and realizing and ex- realizing that they can't hide anymore or they, they, they don't need to be ashamed. Mm. And because they are so educated nowadays, I think there's so much awareness being created of abuse that they realize that they don't need to uh, sit back and take the abuse. They, they can seek help because there's so many places nowadays that offer help to these women and they can break free. They just need to want to do that and be able to take that next step. Yeah, but to take the next step, it must be a difficult process for them also, isn't it? Because it is. once you're caught in that cycle of violence or that cycle of abuse, you're brainwashed into believing you're worth nothing. Definitely. But I think because of, that is why I say that it's not the abuse that's on the increase. It's mm. the fact that people are educated and they know their rights, mm. Islamically or in the Western world. Mm. They know what their rights are. And they know there's things like Islamic care line. Mm-hmm. where you f- take that first step just to acquire that help or that somebody to speak to. And then you speak to that person and you realize it's not, the problem is not with you. And that's your first step t- to saying, this is my way out of it. Or even helping the situation or bettering the situation. And then, you know, as you spoke, I'm just thinking that subhanAllah, our din is so powerful because it's stress knowledge and knowledge is power. Mm-hmm. So once you have the knowledge, you have the information, then you can actually take control of your Thank life. You. So... Basically, when we look at the, the, the story, um, you write, for example, the battle to keep one's faith in Allah is the main theme of this book. When you introduced your book, in order to prove that we are all human, we make mistakes, but we also have the choice to rectify our own. Yes. And I love the, the, you know, the, the choice of words because you have the choice to rectify our wrongs. So these are immense challenges we all face in a cosmopolitan world. All of us. There's nobody no, who definitely. is excluded from that. How does one learn to hold fast? And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَأَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا Hold fast to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you learn that? You know, I think it's only through trial and error and we need to realize that we are making mistakes or when we make those mistakes. But mistakes are not even the thing here because Allah is very forgiving. Mm-hmm. If you go and ask for forgiveness, he will definitely forgive you. And another thing is, it's not even about the mistakes, it's about how we deal with rectifying those mistakes. So so you, you're allowed to make the mistakes, but what is the next step that you do? The first is to, to, as opposed to acknowledge that you've made to a mistake. To acknowledge it, mm. and dua is a very powerful weapon. Mm. Allah is the only one that can give hidayat. So we need to ask Allah for the guidance before anything else. But then all of this t- ties into what you're saying earlier is the ability to know, to have knowledge, to be educated, exactly. to learn, but also to self-reflect, eh? Definitely. And that's what writing gives you, the opportunity to self-reflect? Yes, um, <laughs> most of the time, in the quiet times, yeah. when I don't have any demand for attention. <laughs> Do you find that when you're lying down, maybe or you're breastfeeding or you're, you're busy with you know, a quiet time with the kids or putting them to sleep and that's when your mind is racing and you have all these wonderful thoughts in the minute <laughs> get up they're gone <laughs> definitely you know there's times uh, you know in today's times we have the technology of the cell phone yeah. so i can just go to my notepad and uh, type away whatever thoughts are coming to my head but what happens when it happens in the shower <laughs> and i get this thought in the shower and i repeat myself again and again and i say the first thing i'm going to do when i get out of the shower is go to write go it to down, down yeah. but that doesn't happen because when i get out of the shower it's the baby or the toddler mm-hmm. or someone demanding my attention and before long the thought just floats out of my brain and those are perhaps the most powerful thoughts that we have isn't it i found that and initially when i was writing at night when i'm sleeping i would get these incredible <laughs> sentences that would come in my mind sometimes paragraphs you know i said okay i'm going to remember this but when you wake up in the morning it's all gone and my father used to tell me come on put a notes and a notepad by the side of your table and a pen so when it comes write it down because you're not going to catch yeah. it again in the morning but it never happens it never happens you mm. always say you're going to do the thing and i mean the notepad will stay there <laughs> but then the next day you'll carry it to the lounge and you'll forget about it then you'll jump into your warm bed and you're not going to get out of the bit to do it. So, so what does writing entail? I mean, what, what do you have to do and how does one then self-reflect or take those thoughts and put it onto paper 
or is there um, you know a conscious decision to focus in a particular topic and then you you do research etc on those um, for me um, I write mostly uh, from an emotional point of view mm. so uh, whatever uh, if I do happen to write the thought that I'm uh, speaking about I write it down and I try to um, uh, you know, put everything into that topic. And if I can't continue, I leave it. So anything. you try to conceptualize the emotion. Yes. Okay, we have to go to a break. When we come back, we're really going to talk about Mumtaz then. So we'll see you after the break. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi and welcome to the final segment of Finding Me in the ITV Networks today with author Asma Khan. Uh, before we went on to the break, Asma was speaking about putting her emotion expression, uh, emotive expression, sorry, into her writing and, and expressing through this particular emotive context. And Asma, I think that is basically the nature of women. We use emotion in almost everything that we do, isn't it? Very true. Um, it's hard, uh, you know, sometimes, like I said to you earlier, that we have all these thoughts in our brain and when we want to write it down or say it out loud, it doesn't come out in the correct way. So there must be that burst of emotion for it to be expressed, <laughs> isn't it? Okay, now let's go to the book and Mumtaz. I mean, who is Mumtaz and how did you conceive of her? Mumtaz is the protagonist in the story. She's the main character, the one that everyone falls in love with. Um, how I conceived of her, Mumtaz, um, when I w started writing, I wanted to create um, this person that wasn't perfect. Mm. She had flaws, but everybody could relate to her. They could understand her feelings. And, um, you know, it was difficult when I was writing because I wanted to write one thing and when I was writing it down, something else would pop onto the page. Mm -hmm. And, um, but Shukar, I managed to, I mean, I think I managed to do quite well in letting people relate to Mumtaz. You know, it's interesting that you keep saying that you wanted to project as somebody who's not perfect. And earlier you spoke about a not perfect marriage or a not perfect life. And, and it's, you know, this is a very, very important concept because I think for many people who sit in front of the soapies, etc., and even young girls who are envisioning a marriage, they look at all of these things and, and consider this perfect world. And so the bubble bursts very fast. And that's why we struggle in our relationships, whether it's on a one-to-one -one level or it's in the family or a social interpersonal concept because you have created this image of everything that is perfect and there is no perfection except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so yes okay <coughs> Mumtaz is not this perfect individual but you can identify with her you can relate to her now in relating to Mumtaz, of course, and, and in, in conceiving of Mumtaz, you spoke about or you brought into the storyline the whole situation of abuse. Why did you focus on a storyline of abuse and, for example, not write a love story? <laughs> you know, I'm a big romantic. Uh, um, I love my love stories. <clears throat> but um, when I, my intention to write, an, when I had the intention to write a novel, it wasn't to write a love story. Mm -hmm. Although I did manage to bring several love stories in there. Um, so there is a theme of love. There that is, okay. there is. Okay. But uh, my intention was to write something, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, that has a powerful message that resonates with the reader for a long time. Not a normal romantic love story mm. that they forget about the minute they pick up the next book. And I suppose writing a normal love story just perpetuates the same kind of perfect wall of perfect, a perfect exactly. love, etc. Yes, okay. And um, I also wanted to create um, um, a story that would inspire and motivate the youth, mm -hmm. you know, away from today's like you say, image of perfect world and the way we see things happening on series on TV and things like that. Because it's like that has become their role model to live like the Upper East Side mm. and things like that. But there's no reality there too. And I mean, those lives are so full in many ways of alcohol abuse, drug addiction, fornication. I mean, that in, it, the stories are endless. But you bring many of the social ills into your book as well. Was it necessary? It was. I think, uh, you know, I'm scared uh, for my own children for when they grow up. And, well, I don't know whether I'm going to educate them in the right way for them to grow up and realize that this is wrong and this is right. So for me, it was, I needed, you know, the youth to get a grip and it was an eye opener for them to see that 
much more things happen in life and this is reality not what happens on on these soapies that you watch and things like that as you spoke about you know your concern for your children i'm thinking it's about maybe nanima's wisdom leaving a legacy through through written words which hopefully will germinate into something positive hey inshallah okay now let's come to your book um you know and in, in talking about mumtaz and the role of the wife there is an aspect that usually gets neglected and and of course when we speak about muslim women's roles we don't focus on the contribution or maybe the lack of contribution from the husband so how important is the role of a husband in the development of the wife um it it's very important i mean uh, as muslim women we won't really do something without um your husband's encouragement mm. if you have his encouragement then you believe in yourself and you go out there um and you know you can do what you have to do but um you know that that brings us back to the point of abuse i mean abuse is not only physical it's emotional it's mental as well when uh, i mean husbands um belittle their wives and think that they can't do anything mm-hmm. so it's very important i mean they should uh, husbands should support their wives as wives support their husbands you know a few nights ago on itb i was watching yaver bakes program on the up bringing of children and he came back to that was a rijaluna qawmuna ala nisa that the, uh, the 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 men are the caretakers of the woman but he he made a very pertinent dis- a point and i think this is where many ulama fail too he says there's a difference between male which is rijal i mean men which is rijal and dhakar which is a male so a male is equal to a female in 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 terms of you know if you're looking at uh, Uh, basically uh, you're a different sp- or not equal but i mean in the sense that you, it's a male and it's and, a female yeah. but rijal speaks of a quality and a character of a particular person mm-hmm. and the, one of the most profound characters of rijal would be a man who understands the value of his wife of his family of his society of his responsibilities of his character and that's what allah has said in that verse rijalun qawmuna lan nisa not adhkar qawmun ala Uh, mm-hmm. Nisa, or that the, the uh, that the the males, but he said the men, and I think many men forget this, and so they think in abusing the wife or is establishing his manhood in his fact, superiority. Yes, but in fact, he's detracting from everything that that particular term implies. But we we're coming close to the end, and I want to know from you, uh, your favorite passage from the book. I have many favorite passages, so I won't be able to choose, but they all center around the same thing. It's um. Mumtaz when she um is um telling um or trying to portray her emotions mm-hmm. I think for me because when I wrote those passages down I couldn't after I read it I couldn't believe that I wrote that so now I would go back and read it and I'm like this somebody else definitely wrote that mm-hmm. so for me that because the emotion is so raw and you know you feel the reader feels everything that Mumtaz is feeling mm-hmm. for me those are all in the entire book there's many like that so those pop up all, and, and hit you hard yes, so they do. so perhaps for the viewers if you can you know just indicate to us like a favorite quote or a saying uh, the, my my favorite saying is children are made readers on the laps of the parents by um Emily Buckwald and and when Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam also spoke about the madrasa the, the, the lap of the mother the being ma- the, the first madrasa okay parting advice briefly we we ready to close um i just want to say that um inspire um go out there if you want to do something do it with your soul Alhamdulillah and that's true when it comes from here it is something that is Definitely. certainly reflected and it resonates so thank you very much for being here and for sharing this time with us and i hope viewers that you will go out and and get in or uh, try and find the, uh, can you quickly tell us where we can get um, the books it's uh, in Johannesburg it's available from me if i can leave my details with you okay um or at Al Huda bookstore okay. in Fordsburg so if you can go out to Al Huda bookstore or we'll put as much details or website uh, where you can contact her. and uh, well i hope you'll get it and then engage with the book and see of course that the challenges that you perhaps facing is a challenge that many other women are also facing what well, that assalamu alaikum jazakallah for being here and to the viewers fear money love assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah